Hi, welcome to the Bridge Connection. Glad you're with us today. We're going to pick up our study in 1 John chapter 3. We're going to be in verse 1 in just a moment. Now you're saying that we miss verses. You're, if you're following verse by verse with me, uh, verses uh, 24 uh, through 29, I think it is in the, the last verses of uh, chapter 2. And I was studying that, looking at that, and you know what? I am going to share that next Sunday morning, this coming Sunday morning at our outdoor service, uh, our first service on the campus for a long time. And uh, we invite you to come if you'd like. But as I was looking at that, I've been praying about what, what do you want me, Lord? What is the message for our first Sunday back together after being apart for so long? And uh, he really, really did show me. And, and uh, this is this is really what, me, what he wants me to talk about, I think. But anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to take that and develop it for that study. So if you're going verse by verse, you want to see it all in context, it'll be online after Sunday morning. You can pick it up or um, come to church on Sunday morning. Join with us as we celebrate our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what's going on. Let's pick it up at uh, chapter 3, verse 1, and we'll read for a while and we'll go back and talk about some stuff, okay? <coughs> Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we will be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as it is. And everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Wow. What great verses. You know, the, the love of God. Uh, there is no greater subject in the entire world. Why? Think about this. Because God loves us, it means that he's not far off out of outer space somewhere. It means that he's not distant or unreachable and unconcerned with, with the world. It means that he's not mean and uh, vengeful, um, that he doesn't cause all the bad things that happen to us, like accidents and diseases and death. It means that God is not hovering over us, uh, looking for every mistake we make so that he can punish, punish us for it, you know? On the contrary, God is love. And since God is love, it means that he is bound to show us his love and do things for us and act for us. It means that God cares and, and looks after us. It means that, that God uh, will help us through every trial and every temptation of life. It means that, that God will save us from the sin, evil, corruption, and death of this world. It means that God will provide a way for us to be delivered from the coming judgment of his holy wrath against sin. <laughs> but notice, if God loves us and has demonstrated his love to us, then he must, it's just logical, expect us to respond to that love. He must expect us to love him. Love expects to be loved in return. If in fact, if someone loves us and we do not receive his love, then this love never, re, never touches us. We, we never experience that love. To know love, we have to receive the love and share it. God loves us, but we have to receive his love in order to experience it. We have to enter a, a loving relationship with God in order to really know the love of God. If we don't love God, then we can never know or experience God's love for ourselves. His love will never touch us. It's absolutely essential that we love God if we wish to experience the love of God. Um, few people, I think, really love God. They're, therefore, they, they have to walk through life without knowing God's love and care. Think about it, man. 
they don't love God and they don't walk in, in God's love and truly, truly love God, they have to face all the terrible trials and temptations of life alone. They have to, they have no help except what man can give because they've rejected the love and the help of God. They, they have to face suffering and sorrow and the death, death of loved ones all alone. They don't have the supernatural power of God to help. They've rejected his love. They have to confront death without really knowing if God is on the other side waiting to receive them or not. They have no hope beyond this life. You know, maybe feeling that this life may be all, but not quite sure, wondering if perhaps there might be something after death, but not really certain what it is. You know, I could go on and on listing the things that a, a person has to face if they don't love God. But notice, that person has to face them all alone. But thanks be to God, here's the good news. God loves the whole world. He loves all of us. Therefore, any of us who desire to know God and desire to love and care for God and love him back, we can. All we have to do is respond to his love, open our, our lives and receive his love and then love him in return. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. We read it, but let's deal with it again, okay? Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Think how absolutely astounding this is to be called a child of the supreme majesty of the universe of the supreme intelligence and power that created all things. There's no greater privilege than to be called a child of God. It is the love of God that has bestowed the privilege of, of adoption upon us. No man is a child of God because of any merit or work of his own. We've all, man, is, we, we've rebelled against God. We're born into sin. We're born sinners, man. And we've chosen to go our own way in life and, and do our own thing. And man has, has wanted little to, or if anything, to, to do with God. See, man doesn't want the restraints of God that he puts upon a life. He has preferred to make his own way through life. Therefore, what man has done, I'm talking about man in general, he's rebelled against God. Let's think, he's, he's ignored God, he's neglected God, uh, cursed God, disobeyed God, disbelieved God, uh, rejected God, denied God, and, and the list could go on and on and on. And it's this that makes the love of God so absolutely amazing. It's while we were rebelling, it's while we were opposing God, while we were sinners and enemies of God, while we were standing against God, while we were in wrath and at enmity with God, while we wanted little of anything to do with God, that what happened? God bestowed his love upon us. I want you to listen to some verses here in Romans chapter five, all right? Pick it up at verse six, first of all. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. I'm down to verse eight. But God commands his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if we were enemies, or for when we were enemies, 
we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verses 9 and 10. Is that incredible? Just, just notice that God's love is revealed to us. Well, not just revealed, this is his love. The giving of his son to the world. God bestowed his love upon us by giving his son to die for our sins. Wow, can't comprehend it. I accept it, but I can't comprehend it. We know that God loves us because he's gave his son to die for us. Greater love has no man in this than to die for a friend. And it's the death of Jesus Christ that makes it possible for us to become children of God. You may be listening and say, well, how? How do I become a child of God? When Jesus Christ took our sins upon himself, our sins were removed from us. When Jesus Christ died and paid the penalty for our sins, the penalty was removed from us. Therefore, God is able to receive us as righteous men and women, as being free of sin. When Jesus Christ died for our sins, he removed all sin from us. He freed us of sin. And because of that, God is able to accept you, me, all of us into his family, the family of God. God is able to adopt us as children of God. It says in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. <laughs> Here's another grace verse back in Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, how? Abba, Father, the world doesn't know nor understand believers. This explains why we're ridiculed, mocked, ignored, opposed, abused, rejected, persecuted by the world. You know, and I'm seeing it on television. I'm seeing it in the newsprint. I'm seeing it in books. I'm seeing it in movies, man. Sometimes persecution comes personally at work, at school, in the neighborhood, anywhere, anywhere else. The world just does not under, doesn't understand why believers act and live the way that we do. The world just doesn't understand, so they make fun. I was watching something, a popular program on television just the other night, and turned it off because they were ridiculing somebody who had just quoted the Bible and was living according to that. They called it a fallacy, a, a farce, and it broke my heart. See, the world doesn't understand why, why believers separate themselves from the pleasures and things of the world that they participate in. The world doesn't understand believers who sometimes, many times, deny themselves and, and live sacrificially so they can carry the message of Christ around the world as they give to missions and, and spreading the gospel. The world doesn't understand why why we go to church so much and especially why we talk so much about Jesus Christ. Here's why the world doesn't understand us. Because they do not know Jesus Christ. Think about it. God's very own son came into the world, but the world didn't know him. They wanted nothing to do with him. They rejected him. Now, if the world rejected Jesus Christ, God's very own son, they are bound to reject God's adopted children. The world is just unwilling to recognize and acknowledge that God is, is righteous, that God is pure, that God is just. They want nothing to do with a life and a, and a lifestyle that demands all that a person is and all that a person has. They're just unwilling to give sacrificially to carry the gospel around the world, meet needs of other people and so forth. They don't understand the nature of believers. That believers are the children of God. That we can live no other life than that of following God. Why? Because we know God in all of his love and the majesty, majesty of his being and this world just can't understand that. 
on the verse two of chapter three. Beloved, now we are children of God. It's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Why? For we shall see him as he is. Here John deals with an issue that we have all pondered from time to time. We've all wondered what our Lord must, must have looked like. We wonder how he appears in his glorified body. We wonder what our bodies will be like when, when we get to heaven. Oh, I've thought about that so much ever since Wanda went. I went over to the cemetery a couple days ago and saw where Wanda was and my brother, what Ken was, and my mom and dad and some other friends. And I just started thinking about what they're doing now, what their body's like. The truth is we cannot really know. John knew Christ personally and intimately, yet he didn't know for sure what the believer would see when he enters his glorious presence. We will know one day. This doesn't create cause for alarm or anxiety. There is much that we do not know, but we know that God is good. We know his love for us is immeasurable. We know the peace and joy we have in fellowship with Jesus Christ our Lord. Regardless of what we shall be, we will be in the presence of our Redeemer. It will all be joy when we meet the Lord and spend eternity with him. We know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him. At the moment of our salvation, we were spiritually resurrected, a new creature in Christ. Spiritually, the old man died and we were born again and we still struggle with the old man, the flesh. And, you know, the, the flesh was not changed and we continue to inhabit a body and is prone to sickness, disease, deterioration, sin. But as we grow and mature in the Lord, we are being transformed into the image spiritually of Jesus Christ. But when the Lord appears in the clouds and he calls for the church, we will be transformed physically as well. We will lay aside the old body of flesh and take on a new glorified body. When Christ appears, all the saved, whether dead in the grave or yet alive, will be caught up to meet him in the air and will receive our new bodies. Philippians 3.21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned into his glorious body. <laughs> according to the work and working whereby he is able to even subdue all things unto himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. I just read four weeks in this, in, in, in this verse and First John, for we shall see him as he is. Verse three. This will truly be shouting time for the believers, man. We cannot begin to imagine the joy we shall experience when we meet the Lord in the air, clothed in a new glorified body. I know Paul confirms that, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm convinced the saved enter the, saved enter the very presence of the Lord when they leave this earth in death. However, this is going to be such a glorious time as the redeemed by grace meet the Lord, united in the air. We shall behold the one who bled and died for our sin. We will be eternally free from the presence of sin, Satan, and the hindrance of this life. What a day, glorious day that will be. And everyone who has this hope in him, last of verse three, purifies himself just as he is pure. Much of what we have discussed is beyond our purity, our, our, beyond our ability to comprehend. Uh, we can't fully grasp, I can't, can't fully grasp 
Oh, we shall experience as we meet the Lord in the air. We are assured of our current position and love from the Lord as his children. Even though we can't fully comprehend it, we can still rejoice. Our hope is settled in the Lord. He's the anchor of our soul. Complete victory was won as he died on the cross and rose victoriously from the grave. Although I can't grasp it or explain it all, I am more certain and confident of my future with the Lord than anything I know. I am more confident of my eternal state than I am of my next five minutes. I don't know if I have five minutes left in this life, but I know I have an eternity, and I'm confident of that. All who possess such marvelous hope are challenged to purify themselves before the Lord. That's not to say we'll never sin or, or come short of what the Lord desires of us, but we will earnestly seek to live in a way that pleases the Lord. Those who are born again in Christ, walking in fellowship with him, cannot sin and enjoy it. Children are chastised for sin and we are called to heed the guidance of the Spirit. As the Spirit guides, we are to follow, seeking a life of purity. It says, even as he is pure. Jesus Christ is our example. He set the standard we're to follow. As much as humanly possible, we are to imitate the life of Christ. He is a standard of excellence and righteousness. There was no fault or sin found in him. Just as Christ is pure, we too are to seek his righteousness. That really brings a proper perspective. As I compare my life to the life of Christ, I realize I have failed miserably. There's much work to be done. I will never achieve the level of righteousness he possesses but it serves as a standard to pursue. There's always room for improvement. I pray we all seek to become more like Jesus as we seek to serve him. This is such a comforting passage that brings great confidence to the children of God. We have received so much more than our minds can comprehend. I do know that I belong to the Lord and have been positioned within the family of God. I know that I will meet the Lord in the air one day, receiving a new glorified body. As I consider all that we have discussed, I am challenged in my walk with the Lord and pursuit of purity. I want to honor him with the life that I live. I want to resemble the Lord that I serve. This passage deals with reality, the position of believers and, and, and guarantees our future is more certain than anything we experience in this physical realm. We are assured of a, a place in heaven throughout eternity, eternity because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the only way to obtain such comfort and confidence. Eternity awaits, but listen, Apart from Christ, it will be just as dreadful for those who have denied Jesus as it is joyful for those who have received him. So I have to ask, where do you stand today? If the Lord were to call for the church right now, are you certain you would meet him in the air, accepted as one of the family? If not, seek him. Will he may be found? Come. Right now, today, as the Lord calls you, simply just pray in your heart, in your mouth, speak, cry out, however you want to. Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. I deserve to be separated from you for eternity. But in your grace and mercy, you, God, Jesus Christ, came and took my sin upon you, the sinless one. And when you died, your blood was shed and washed away my sin as I receive what you did for me. It's applied to me. I receive you into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Break bondages in my life. 
set me free to worship you in your name. Now get in a church somewhere, one that proclaims the name of Jesus. Find a believer that you know and tell him you prayed to receive Jesus today, all right? I want to leave you with this one thing. It's so important. God loves you. Love him back.